knowing and being confident of my role and also respecting their role, their expertise, their background, I think is possibly the only way to have a healthy working relationship. Hey, I've noticed this. I know you probably didn't mean it this way, but this is how I've perceived it. You know, what can we do to move forward? Why did you start your nursing career as an adult gerontology acute care nurse practitioner? I initially started my education thinking I'd be pre-med. I wanted to try nursing first to see if I actually enjoy being in the hospital and taking care of patients. I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and I did their Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. As I was doing nursing, I met my kind of current lifetime mentor, Dr. Kimberly Edwards. She was our first year clinical instructor director. I was very, very, very intimidated by her at first. Like she was very proper, very professional, and just very, very put together. As we went through clinical, she kind of dove more into what being a nurse is, our roles, our responsibilities. So I was really impressed by the qualities that she would talk about. Being a prepared nurse is a good nurse. When you're dealing with patients, don't just think about how they're treating you, but kind of consider how they're feeling because they're technically at their most vulnerable point, right? When they're in the hospital bed. That's how I kind of continued to stay in nursing and I graduated with my BSN. Coincidentally, I had to get a TB screen and I found that I had like latent TB. So I had to go to a TB clinic and the person taking care of me was a lovely woman named Kelly Bean. I will never forget her. She was like the main provider taking care of me through all those treatments and doing all my follow-up appointments. She was just such a bright personality. I could tell that she just loved life and she was very, very proud to be a nurse practitioner. Up until that point, I had never kind of known what a nurse practitioner is. During my follow-up appointments, I would take a moment to ask different questions like, how did you choose to become a nurse practitioner? What do you love about being a nurse practitioner? And what she described to me was very interesting. The scope of practice that she had, engage with families, kind of come up with her own initial plan and then discuss with the attending how much she found that role to be rewarding really caught my interest. Fast forward several years after I had been working as a staff nurse at NYU, I was like, oh, continue to reflect back on my encounters with Dr. Edwards, my clinical instructor and Kelly. Instead of just taking orders that people would prescribe for me, I think it would be really meaningful and I would find it enjoyable to be able to make my own plan tailor it with the attending, you know, write my own orders. 2016, that's when I uh, decided to go to adult gerontology, acute care nurse practitioner program at UPenn. That's kind of how I physically became um, an AGACMP. In terms of how I specifically chose the adult gerontology acute care with the NP role, there's a lot of different you know directions you can do. You can do peds, you can do adult, you can do family, you can do psych. I personally just wanted to treat adults and the aging population. I just didn't think emotionally I could handle kids being sick. And acute care specifically because I wanted to take care of like the sickest of the sick. I've um, always kind of had a heart for missions as well. And I figured if I wanted to go abroad, um, I just wanted to get as much exposure to the sickest people I could. I have no regrets. I really love it a lot. Yeah, and I love that you lay out different specialties in NPs and then explain why you did adult and gerontology population and acute care. So mm -hmm. right now you're working in your ICU. Can you explain what your responsibility is as an AG, ACNP in your ICU? To work in any ICU, as far as I'm aware, hospitals prefer slash require that you, that you have an acute care licensure. If you want to do outpatient or just do like um, clinics or urgent care, I don't think you need an acute care. So that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. Other than NPs, there's also PAs in the neuro IC too, in our neuro ICU. They have a more like generalist training, but they've had rotations in the ICU as well. So they have exposure to it and they have experience. In terms of roles and responsibilities, PAs and NPs are effectively the same um, in our neuro ICU. We have something called Fast Hugs BID. It's an acronym for the things that our attendings and our team specifically want us to kind of take charge of. F and Fast Hugs is is um, feeding. So making sure, you know, do they have a diet order in? If they don't, why don't they? Can they take an oral diet? Do they have dysphagia? If they do, do they need two feeds? So feeding 
A is in um, analgesia, making sure that their pain is well controlled. Are they constantly requiring lots of narcotics, opioids? Also kind of taking into consideration like multimodal approach, but also not giving them so much medication that they're not like hemodynamically unstable. And we can actually get like an effective neuro exam on them because obviously in the neuro ICU, you have to have a good neuro exam. S um, would be sedation. Is the patient going to require sedation? If so, how much for how long? Are they on a ventilator? If so, when can we wean them off sedation? If they're on propofol, can we maybe transition them to Presidex or will they do better with Presidex? T is uh, thromboprophylaxis. So do they have DVT prophylaxis? If they don't, why don't they? Are they like a high bleeding risk? If they don't, when can they? You know, which one? Heparin versus Lovenox. Hugs, U, GI prophylaxis. I mean, I mean, all of our patients who are intubated obviously need GI prophylaxis because, you know, they're not taking anything orally and they're at high risk for ulcer bleeding which actually happens a lot more than people realize. When people's hemoglobin drop for no apparent reason, it's kind of one of the things to keep in mind. Like, are they bleeding from the inside? But GI prophylaxis, making sure that they have like an H2 blocker, PPI kind of thing on if they require it. Hugs G, uh, blood glucose, like glycemic control. So managing that. SBT. So again, ventilator management. And then bowel, bladder. Have they had a bowel movement? Do we have an obstruction? Do we have an ileus? Making sure that that's something on our mind. Foley management as well, which is the eye, the indwelling foley. If they need it, or if we can get it out, because we definitely, you know, want to prevent UTIs as much as possible. D, drug escalation. You know, do they need this much narcotics? If they haven't required like something in particular, can we wean them off of it? Should we change it up for antibiotics? We've had a certain day course. Can we come off of it now? Or when we did repeat cultures, did it grow something else? I mean, any kind of pivot medications. So those are the main kind of things that we prepare, manage the plans for. We kind of also herald coordination of care. Are they going to be transferring out of the ICU soon? Can they? If they are, are they going to go home? Are they going to go to the floor? Should we consult social work to get, you know, pre-certification started for like sniffer LTAC procedures? So we in the neuro ICU do intubation, central lines, arterial lines, LPs. The final piece would be um, discussions with family and patients. Now, I mean, granted, a lot of our patients aren't really conscious, so we can't really necessarily explain things with them, but they definitely have family members or loved ones who come in who are, and rightly so, very, very like anxious, confused, like frustrated. I mean, obviously, sometimes attendings have discussions with them as well, but because attendings cover a lot of different hospital systems. And so they're not always able to have conversations with all 20 family members, right? The APPs, um, nurse practitioners and PAs do a lot of the family discussions too. It's a busy shift. Oh, yeah. Well, I've known you for a while. Listening to what you do and like you laying out the responsibilities of what you do. Oh my God. Yeah. What? I'm so watching slow. <laughs> Oh, we, we, we see each other in like classrooms and stuff. Even though we were in the same NP program, like everyone's specialty is different. Like we don't really yeah. know what you do in yeah. clinicals either. It's a lot of learning. It's definitely a process, but if you're really passionate about it, it's um, rewarding. What is it like to work as an acute care NP in ICU setting? Like navigating through different relationships. Working is all about communication and building good teamwork inevitably when you deal with people there's always like a possibility for conflict and I guess there's two main avenues that we like you know one could take one would be just sitting down and having like an open discussion hey like how are you feeling about this this is how I'm feeling about this, what went well or what went wrong, like how can we come to an agreement, what can we do to move forward, and then when it's with coworkers that you end up having to have conflict, it gets like, it can be really, really stressful being in the ICU, and um, our ICU is a 20-bit ICU. There's a lot, a lot of sick people. I feel like people are getting sicker. There's an incredible amount of stress just dealing with constant moving pieces with all these people being so sick, but then if you end up having conflict with colleagues or co workers that can add a lot of unnecessary stress the way I've navigated through that is just having a frank conversation with them because I've been lucky enough that they're just very good people hey I've noticed this I know you probably didn't mean it this way but this is how I've perceived it you know what can we do to move forward there's just so many things that we already are you know worried about things that we have to do how can we come to a consensus to work together as a team how can I support you this is how I would appreciate help or feedback, things like that. And just being able to have like an open conversation, very honest, still professional, but open conversation, I think is the best. And that also takes time to learn too, because communication is like an ever-growing skill. 
I've learned that even if you feel like you're good, you can always be better. So it's, sure. it's definitely a skill learning how to listen to not just like physically, but like, what are they actually trying to tell me? I think listening is very important in communicating yeah. too. Because we yeah. are so focused on like speaking all the time. Yeah. And we yeah. don't listen. <laughs> how about relationships with physicians? I think I've been pretty lucky. I trust my attending. They're not out to like catch me doing wrong or making mistakes. At least all the attendings in the neuro I see that I've worked with, they've all been passionate about patient first, making sure that they do the best by the patient. You know, obviously do no harm. They are people that for one, I guess I trust their expertise. They're very, very all like very smart, very skilled, experienced. Thankfully, I've had a healthy respect for them. From the APP side, there's always room to grow and there's always um, things that we want to be better in. I can say pretty confidently that we all strive to be team members who are trustworthy as well. It's always a learning curve though, just kind of figuring out what attendings prefer. Also realizing that there's not always like one way to do something because, you know, we have five intensivists and they all rotate. They all have different ways of approaching and reasons for approaching different things in slightly different ways. I think a lot of nurses in Korea, they're curious mm-hmm. about the reputation of advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. What is your thought in working as an NP in critical care setting? It kind of might depend on a couple of things. One is urban or rural areas. Certain hospitals, certain units, certain services are more used to hiring and employing advanced practice providers and certain hospitals and or institutions and services are not. Some services are super welcoming. The physicians are very open to having um, advanced practice providers. Our ICU intensivists um, expect a lot out of us and they entrust a lot of responsibility to us. But I know it's not always the case. I sometimes follow patients up on the floors, um, like on the step down or med surge floors. They're not as accustomed to working as closely with nurse practitioners the way that we are in the neuro ICU. So sometimes they don't really know how much to trust us as APPs, how much to involve us in the patient's care. That can be the case in any hospital, right? But in either case, I think it's very, very important for us to have a clear idea and um, knowledge of what our scope of practice is. How much are we expected to do? How, How much are we legally allowed to do? And how can we take care of those responsibilities to the fullest, right? And how can we be as helpful as we can. So knowing those roles and responsibilities and scope of practice so that we can build a more trusting relationship with our medical counterparts, our our attending physicians, even other fellows, residents, so that we can help them. They can help and guide us as well. It's it's been a a contentious topic, right? Um, Some physicians feel like NPs are encroaching on their jobs, their careers. NPs feel like, oh, physicians are trying to push us off our turf. But I think it's, like I said, important for us to know what we can do, what we're capable of doing, and working hard to gain that trust, build that working relationship, be as like I guess almost powerful in our role as we can and empowering in our role as we can. It can be difficult to speak on behalf because we have all yeah. of different ideas and yeah. perception about how we see the role and in which setting we work in, right? I'm not a nurse practitioner, but when you work as an advanced practice person, like you have to aware of your scope of work and what you're capable of doing, yeah. as you said. And then you're trying to hold the highest standard in what you are responsible for, right? Yeah. Physicians have their own specialty of medicine. Mm. Nurses have their own specialty of nursing. And we're trying mm-hmm. to hold the, the best standard and practice for the patients for the patient outcome. So I think it's really important when you said that I'm trying to do it the best that I can Mm -hmm. for what I do. Holding yourself, myself to the highest standard that I can helps me take pride in my role, but also gives me ownership of my, my role too, right? It means if I've made a mistake, I bring it up to my attending or whoever as soon as I find out about it. Or if I feel like, oh, this is what we had initially planned. But in talking with them, I feel like maybe this might be a better route for this patient. Just doing as much as I can on my end and then being able to have that collaborative relationship with a physician. They're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Oh yeah, I never thought about that. 
Thanks for bringing that up. Good point. They're in charge of so much. And then their background is, is medical. Mine's nursing. Um, even though I have, I have had medical training, there's different things that I bring to the table and that I should bring to the table. There's way different things that the attending physician, especially neurocritically trained physicians, they bring a whole other set of skills, knowledge, expertise that I really, 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 really appreciate. And they've gone through significantly more training than I have. Knowing and being confident of my role and also respecting their role, their expertise, their background, I think is possibly the only way to have a healthy working relationship because they respect us for what we do and I respect them and we respect them for what they do. If we don't hold ourselves to the highest standard, that working relationship and the trust that they have in us or even maybe had in us can crumble pretty easily. So I think it's about holding myself to the higher standard, doing my best to continuously learn, grow, and make my role known and respecting them and trying to learn from them as much as possible. When we were at Penn, they put a, a lot of emphasis, primary care versus acute care MPs, because yeah. They have different scope of work and what sure. conditions that they see. But I feel there is gray line in reality, mm -hmm. acute versus primary care. Can acute care MPs work in primary care settings and vice versa? It's kind of tricky. Acute care MPs can't work in primary care office or even urgent cares, I believe. In order to have and maintain your acute care licensure, you have to have proven and verified that you've worked in an acute care setting for excellent number of hours. Um, and same thing with primary care. As an adult acute care NP, I can't take care of all ages. I can only do 18 and up. If I were to, that would be out of my scope. Same thing with peds. NPs, they can't take care of adults. Acute versus primary, the only differentiation that I'm aware of is physically where you work because primary can't work inside like an inpatient unit, right? Or inpatient service. Acute really can't do outpatient because outpatient wouldn't be acute, right? If you're following up, with someone in an outpatient office, they're obviously not acute enough to warrant inpatient hospitalization. The setting is more of the differentiating factor aside from the fact that the duration of the, the illnesses that we take care of would be different. It's like long-term management of diabetes, those things would be more primary care. Acute DKA or HHS, those kinds of syndromes, something that you would be taking care of inpatient. How can a nurse become an AGACMP? After you get your Bachelor of Science in Nursing, you sit for boards and you get your RN. After you get your RN, I know of some programs where you can just go directly to RN to NP and do like a BSN to MSN. I definitely recommend working several years before going into like a program like we did with, with MSN. I know for acute care NP programs, they usually require years of experience in the IC or a step down acute care setting. Um, BSN RN work for about three to five years. Then go for your master's if you want to. Really kind of figuring out what specific pa patient population and kinds of illnesses that you want to want to be working with on a daily basis. Where does your passion lie? Like, is, does it lie in peds? Does it lie in hematology, oncology? Is it midwifery? Really developing an idea of where your passion lies and then going to grad school for your MSN and then sitting for your boards and getting your NP licensure. When you apply for your MSN, they'll ask slash require you to put down a specialty. After adult and peds, within adults, there's Acute care, primary, you can kind of figure out, do I only want to, again, work in inpatient, outpatient? And I chose acute care. And from there, some people choose to work in an ICU setting. Some people will choose to work in the internal medicine service. And some people choose to specialize like further and do specifically like cardio, GI, things like that. It is a graduate degree. Highly, highly, highly recommend like working three to five years. Getting some serious like work experience under your belt before you choose to become an MP and make sure you really, really, really want to become an MP before you <laughs> apply and do so because it's very different and you shouldn't just do it because that's the next possible career. You, you should definitely have specific reasons for wanting to go and yeah, go from there. Yeah, well, when you started as a new RN, how did you fall into working in PACU? I kind of came from like a financially difficult 
background. Like I said, initially I wanted to do medicine, but then after having lots of discussions with my family, we kind of decided that I needed to work while I was going to school because even though I got a lot of scholarships to go to undergrad, my family didn't have enough money to financially support me through even undergrad. After even freshman year, I think I started working um, at NYU during all of my breaks, during my summer winter breaks. My first was as a student nurse extern at NYU. Through that program, we rotated through all of the different units. You know, we did step down, we did ortho, we did PACU. They're like, okay, which unit did you want? Do you want to work? And they train nurse externs. They train them in anticipation to hire them. Right. And I was like, wow, like the nurses who work in the PACU just seem like so cool. (laughs) They seem like so confident. They seem like so badass. In retrospect, I don't really recommend a new grad going into PACU. Um, (laughs) Don't you like need to have critical care experience usually? They made like a critical care program for me actually because I was like the first like new grad that they had even the nurses they were like like, you want you should work on the floor first and I was like kind of too late but (laughs) um, it's it's definitely fun and I had a great time you definitely want to get a more general experience first know how to talk to patients learn how to deal with meds learn how to deal with difficult situations what's like appropriate ways to behave, things like that. (laughs) Um, I did have to do a lot of learning afterwards in grad school at Penn. There was just like all these things that all these ICU nurses knew. Mm -hmm. I was like, what are they talking about? So (laughs) um, I had to do a lot of self-study, self-learning to kind of catch up in some aspects. I love it. I still survived and it was, it was fine. But for anyone else out there who's trying to do um, pack you out of the school, do not do it, please. Just... <laughs> so you did B- BSN, PACU, uh-huh. you, mm-hmm. NP program, and you worked in neurocritical care while you were doing NP program? No, when we were in school, I actually considered working part time. But with all like the extra learning I had to do, I think just emotionally, I just needed to just do school. Afterwards, it was like during COVID. So the job market was kind of wonky. It was very, 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 very difficult for NPs at the time. And I worked in a neurotrauma unit as an RN. I did that for about a year. And then I did a critical care fellowship. It was like a mini school. They did all these lectures. They did procedural training. They did ultrasound training. Um, I rotated through a whole bunch of different units. Or during one of my rotations, I started to do the medical surgical ICU because it was a critical care fellowship. But I found out there's something called a neuro IC. And I was like, oh, what is that? <laughs> oh my gosh, this is like my dream job. Like I love neuro, which is apparently like not so popular opinion. After I finished that uh, fellowship, I was like looking for jobs as I moved to a new city to be with my husband. And then there was like a neuro ICU position. I was like, oh, this is like meant to be. I have to apply. <laughs> like interviewing at the hospital and meeting the team, I just felt like everything was so right. So I got an offer and I accepted the position and that's how it happened. I hear yeah. like your excitement. Yeah. <laughs> when you explain it, I love this. I have a lot of nurses um, that I work with who are interested in NPs and they ask me a lot of questions, but I was like, if you love nursing and you want to, you enjoy what you do, just, you can stay there. And you continue to do what you do. There's a whole slew of ways to branch out as a nurse. If you want to do an NP, it's not necessarily the easiest way to make money. I hope that whatever field you go into, whatever specialty, you're like really, really passionate about it because and it's physically, emotionally, mentally draining. And it's very, very um, tough. And there's definitely great days amazing days and then there's tough days and so you definitely need to love what you do and be passionate about it because that's the only way that you're going to stay sane or else you might become a really sad bitter person (laughs) (laughs) that's so true even though I love love this role this job the neuro I see you I love the brain I still come home and I'm like to my husband I'm just like I am so so exhausted and sometimes there's days I cry because it's been an emotionally rough day but the only thing that keeps me going is just obviously supportive family but the fact that I just love these people like my coworkers, I love my patients you definitely have to love it how do you think a nurse can increase their earning potential as a nurse like an uh, RN specifically you can do something called a charge nurse but they're kind of like the unit manager almost not like nurse manager but the nurse unit manager they kind of manage 
the patient assignments, who, what patients are getting admitted, who is transferring out. They, they like put all, all the fires. They wear all the hats. By doing um, charge nurse, you can make a little bit more. There's another like a clinical ladder where you can do like different certifications, education, CMEs, or where you can climb up the clinical ladder. You can get higher compensation for it. Your salary is augmented by not like a significant amount, but it's several dollars per hour that you can, you know, orient, be a preceptor, different hospitals and different floor services compensate different amounts, you can pick up extra shifts. You can be a nurse educator too, but I think you might have to get an MSN for that. As an NP, you can obviously also pick up extra shifts. You can work PRN at another job. I have two coworkers right now. One of them picks up a lot of extra shifts and the other one works another PRN job and their salary is significantly more. I'm figuring out ways that I can have like an extra stream of income myself. I feel like there's other ways to kind of invest my creative side too, or like bring out my experience or background to other people. And we were talking about like making passive income streams, right? Yeah. We have to understand that we're not going to work all the time. And there Mm -hmm. can be situations that we may get sick. We can have family situations sure, that yeah. are, doesn't allow us to work like yeah. at the pace that we work. That you're starting to learn about investing. How yeah. are you? How are you starting to learn about investing? We have endless resources. We have um, books. We have Kindle. We have YouTube. We have internet, we have Google. I told you about the two books that I have uh, recently purchased. The Psychology of Money, which was highly recommended by some former colleagues and also a lot of money experts on YouTube. And then Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, Um, classic. I'm starting with those books. And then a lot of YouTube videos. And also looking through my health insurance and my retirement portals because they have like a lot of info, like modules or videos Mm. or like pamphlets that are available. I feel like in our parents' generation or even maybe 10 years ago, like hard work rewarded you fully. So all you had to do was just work hard at your one job and that was it. But now it's just more of like trying to make your money work for you and having more streams of income and passive income. It's not always work hard. Your life will be secured kind of thing. Yeah, Juan, if the audience wants to connect with you online, how can they do so? I use Instagram and um, LinkedIn. They can reach me there. If you message me on Instagram, let me know that you found me through Rich Nurse page. I'd definitely be happy to chat with other NPs, other nurses, and help out in any way I can.